Welcome, everybody. Warm welcome to the 21st Knowledge Cafe of the Integrated Policy Practitioners Network, IPPN. Uh, some of you may have been here before, uh, others are new. Very warm welcome from all of us. My name is Simona Costanzo So. I'm the Chief Academic Partnerships at the United Nations System Staff College. Uh, we are one of the uh, United Nations learning and training institutions. And I'd really like to thank our colleagues from IPPN, from the Integrated Policy Practitioners Network for allowing us to host today's sessions. And I'm very enthusiastic about the fantastic speakers we have. Before introducing them, let me just say a little bit more about the IPPN. Um, for those who don't know, it's an initiative of 10 founding UN entities to create a community space where you can share your lessons and your experiences and to strengthen the collective capacities to apply integrated policy approaches in concrete and practical ways to support the implementation of the 2030 agenda. We know that at this point, it's all about acceleration of the agenda. And the big question obviously is, how can it be done? How is it being done? How can we share these practices? How can we learn from each other? The IPPN is a primarily a UN interagency network, but it's also open to colleagues from government, academia, and the broader development community. It's managed by UNDP, UNESCO, UNFPA, UNICEF, ILO, and FAO. And the purpose of the series is to have these, or, or the purpose of the series of these monthly cafes is to showcase, as I said, insightful experiences um, that allow us to understand how progress can be accelerated and what we can learn from each other. So with that, I'm happy to introduce our speakers today. We are joined by Dr. Imi Scholz, who is the co-president of the Heinrich Böll Foundation uh, Germany and is also uh, one of the uh, co-chairs of the Global Sustainable Development Report, which we will hear uh, a little bit more about in a second. Our second speaker is Ambuj Sarkar, Professor of Policy Studies and founding head of the School of Public Policy at the Indian Institute of Technology, um, who is also one of the authors of the GSDR 2023. We are then also joined by Joao Vitor Dominguez, who is the head of the Institutional Relations Office of the National School of Public Administration in Brazil. Um, Dr. Scholz and Dr. Saga will tell us a little bit more, uh, or not just a little bit, about the last GSDR 2023 that is specifically focusing on capabilities to, uh, to work towards transformation. And then we'll hear specifically from uh, Joao how that is playing out in the context of NRP, the National School of Public Administration. Before we start, just a little bit of housekeeping. Please make sure that you keep your microphones muted to allow all the colleagues to hear the presenters and use the chat function at any time to ask questions or share your experiences or insights throughout the session. And then once we are through uh, the, the, the initial discussion, we'll keep it uh, conversational there will also be an opportunity for your Q&A. We will try to be on time and finish um, 55 minutes from now. So with this, I'm very pleased to hand over the floor to start setting the scene. As I was saying, we're talking today about capabilities uh, to address the uh, transformation. And maybe before we go into the nuts and bolts of it, if you could just set the scene a little bit about um, the GSDR and where this notion is actually coming from. Ime, you have the floor. Yeah, thank you, Simona. It's a pleasure uh, and an honor to be here with you, with those of us, of, of us, I say, who are concerned with the SDGs and want to contribute to them being implemented as much as is possible. We, we, the title of the GSDR this time is Times of Crisis and Times of Change because we see both of that. We see, uh, and maybe you could move on to the next slide already. This is a chart with which we want to show how far we are from achieving uh, the SDGs. There are a few indicators which are in the green area, but many of them, too many, are in the yellow and even in the orange or red area, so very far from uh, having a chance to be implemented. And this is, of course, due to the crisis um, the globe went through in, in very different ways, uh, the, the COVID crisis, um, uh, ongoing conflicts and wars, um, 
which which uh, created big barriers. But um, we also say times of change because these crises show what has to give us a hint on what has to change fundamentally for uh, being for avoiding crisis or for keeping the problems smaller and avoid turning them into crisis. So um, we have the the understanding that understanding crisis may facilitate uh, a political will and societal uh, will towards uh, the type of transformation which is required by the SDGs. Now, if we go to the next um, slide, is this, uh, this is a, a graph which is from the previous GSDR, from the GSDR in 2019, uh, because when we met first in the first few months, uh, we agreed as a team that we would build on the previous GSDR. And we hope the next generation, which will follow us now, will also build on, on ours. Um, because we agree with the analysis that business as usual strategies won't deliver the SDGs. This is something which was already clear in 2019. And actually, it was clear while the SDGs were, were uh, discussed and negotiated in the Intergovernmental Working Group. And that's why we talk about transformation and transformative change, which means that you have to follow it, the best strategy to adopt is to follow on the synergies that exist between different uh, SDGs so that you uh, adopt measures which promote several SDGs at the same time. And why this is not business as usual is because our policymakers are not used to look for what they share, what they have in common, but usually they compete for attention, they compete for resources. Um, and therefore uh, are often far away from synergistic action. But that's what's needed. And the entry points for transformation, which had been identified by the previous GSDR, are um, group the SDGs and uh, are designed in a way that they make it easier to uh, identify a synergistic action that is at the same coherent that integrates policy fields, that integrates the levers, which are governance, and, uh, economic and financial policy and regulation um, and action, individual and collective action, so civil society, but also individual behavioral change, the use of science and technology. Uh, those are the levers which we took from the previous uh, GSDR. And we identified a fifth one, capacity building, which Ambuch will talk uh, on later. Um, but we think that uh, engaging in transformative action, which is synergistic, coherent, and locally relevant, requires new approaches from policymakers and other practitioners across the civil society, economy, and so on. And therefore, specific capacities need to be built for that purpose. So we could go on for the next um, slide. This is another perspective of the synergies I was mentioning before. So understanding the interlinkages between SDGs um, and uh, use those uh, interlinkages and, and synergies for acceleration. That is uh, not only for implementation, but for accelerating, making it uh, uh, quicker. And um, this uh, is very important to do in a context specific way because interlinkages work out differently depending on the context. Uh, and this refers both to economic context, the geographical and climatic and, and uh, um, ecological context, as much as cultural and administrative context, because there are different ways of, of doing things to uh, uh, achieve similar objectives and uh, results. And the last point I would like to make here is that capacities for um, in science and development are, are extremely important for being able to understand the context specificity of synergies and policy measures. Uh, and therefore, it is important also to boost international cooperation in the sense of strengthening uh, science and R&D capacities in countries with very weak systems. So to see scientific cooperation not only as a tool in international competition, but really as a contribution to the global common good. And here I would leave it and pass on to Ambush. Anush, over to you then. Um, thank you very much. Uh, again, it's a pleasure to, for me also to be here. And I'm uh, 
delighted to be um, actually talking about our report and uh, some of the key messages which uh, we believe are really useful uh, in practice for uh, the transformations that uh, Amy talked about earlier. Uh, I want to just kind of start by saying that, you know, uh, the topic, the title of our, of our report was, it said the subtitle was Science for Accelerating Transformations. Uh, and I think that really is, is uh, the central point on this figure on the screen, because it's a kind of very stylistic way of depicting uh, the nature of transformations. Uh, and before I get into discussing the transformations and the role of capacities in these transformations, I want to just kind of highlight three points uh, that it, what we need to do is accelerate these transformations. We need to make these transformations more effective. And we also need to make sure that these trans we are able to leverage the synergies between uh, different kinds of SDGs and also between the SDGs and national developmental aspirations. Uh, so in a sense, that kind of tells us about the first kind of capacity that we need, which is a capacity that helps us understand the nature of the synergies among SDGs and between the SDGs and national developmental aspirations uh, with the understanding that this kind of an understanding is very uh, context specific. It, it'll vary from country to country. Uh, SDGs will synergize in different ways in different countries, and there also will be different kinds of synergies between uh, SDG-related transformations and national developmental aspirations. So that's the first kind of capacity that just helps us understand what is the kind of transformation we need. Uh, but the other main insight that we get from, from the scientific literature is that these transformations, once you have a sense of what the transformations you want, you yeah, can actually you can manage these kind of transformations if you have a sense of the the nature of the transformation process. And on the screen here, you will see the green uh, transformation, which is the rise of sustainable systems, has three phases: emergence, acceleration, and stabilization. And therefore, if we want to drive a sustainable transformation, we've got to understand that we have to pay attention to each of these three phases. For the emergence phase, of course, when we are saying emergence and the rise of sustainable systems, it means that you need the capacity to, to generate new sustainable alternatives that allow us to uh, engage in this sustainable transformation. Just to give you a very quick example, if one is thinking about uh, climate change and climate mitigation, uh, uh, renewable energy is uh, a, a new alternative that allows us to generate uh, uh, energy in a low carbon and therefore more, more climate friendly way. So it's an example of uh, the uh, using capacity to generate new alternatives. And then as we get into the acceleration phase, as that alternative becomes more uh, situated and more well uh, stabilized, uh, actually less, not fully stabilized, but at least uh, scaling up in society, we need the capacity to, to assess as we are scaling up, to make course corrections so that we continue on path and uh, rise up as the green curve uh, indicates. But of course, this also means uh, as that um, a transformation is becoming more uh, uh, spreading through society, you need to coordinate across various actors. And also, of course, sometimes uh, uh, have conflicts and trade-offs that need to be managed. And then at the, at, as, as the a, as a, a, a sustainable development transformation actually stabilizes, becomes horizontal, then you need to make sure that you have institutions that actually can facilitate the continued stabilization of that kind of a uh, transformation. I want to just also very quickly mention that at this point, there also, any rise of sustainable system will also normally involve the decline of what are dominant unsustainable systems. So in this case, I think, for example, if I, if I run the example of renewables again, the dominant unsustainable system, obviously, as everybody knows, is fossil energy. Um, and, and therefore, we also have to think about how to phase that down over time. Uh, uh, and you will also need different kind of capacities to make sure that you can manage this kind of uh, dominant sustainable system uh, going down. And part of it is also making sure that the communities and in many cases, the countries that are getting disadvantaged by the decline of dominant unsustainable systems, their concerns have to be taken into account. So in other, way, other words, I think I'll just end by saying that uh, 
if one has an understanding of the transformation process, uh, one can actually then put in place and should put in place the right kind of capacities to manage the rise of sustainable transformations and to manage the decline of the unsustainable uh, systems. And together, this allows us, uh, in, a, in a way, to move towards accelerating our SDG transformation, to make sure they are more effective and much more rooted in the national context, and also to uh, uh, take account of the synergies between the SDGs and bit across the SDGs and national development aspirations. I'll just end by saying, uh, make a point that Amy also ended with, the role of sci science, and when, when we mean science, we actually don't mean only natural science, but we also mean science, broadly different forms of knowledge, are absolutely key in helping us understand these transformations, build the capacities and drive the transformations. Uh, I'll stop with that, thank you. Thank you so much, Ambuj. And uh, I mean, these these graphs look quite complex, but in a, in a sense, it's it's a thought experiment to understand in which phase of the transformation we are. In the actual report, you actually show different evolutions that obviously depending on how acceleration goes, um, how fast, how fast you go, what resistance you face, they could, the, the, the phases could also look different. So I'd invite everyone to actually go to the full report um, and look at this a little bit more closely. Now, Ambuch, I understand you're also the inventor of the fifth layer lever, or at least someone who has uh, strongly advocated for it among the co-chairs. You're going to maybe tell us the behind the scenes later on. But obviously we're listening, we're hearing both of you, Ime and Ambuch, we hear you say we're behind. Uh, there are different phases of transformation we need to be cognizant of, and we need to get better in pushing the acceleration by doing different things and doing things differently. Business as usual is not an option. So this is now the question, and obviously here, all actors will be asked, and the public sector is one of the important actors who will need to do something about it. We now have Joao, um, who can tell us a little bit more about how this has been playing out in Brazil. So there is a realization that progress needs to be accelerated. You've had times when the space for public servants um, was quite complex to maneuver. How, essentially, how did you build capacities? What did you learn? What can you share with us on how this is actually playing out in the real world with the example of Enapi? Joao, over to you. Thanks, Simona. Thanks once again. It's an honor to be here with you. Uh, today, I'm gonna share with you a little bit more about some takeaways and learning points from a practitioner that trying to implement the 2030 agenda for about six to seven years in Brazil. Uh, and as you know, in Brazil, uh, we have we have suffered a lot of a number of changes, especially in the political level in the government during these years. And uh, and we we could understand uh, that, uh, especially in a moment where the government thought some expressions uh, like, for example, sustainable development, sometimes uh, they are not allowed to be uh, said in the government for some institutions uh, during four years, uh, SDGs as well. And, and we try to, the, the public agents that are trying to implement the agenda in the field, they need to understand the shortcuts uh, to build narratives on that level. So capacity development try to be, uh, we have changed a lot of some strategies in the country and we can, uh, and, I'm, I, and I'm, I'm here to explain a little bit more about that. You can pass this slide, please. Um, we saw that, uh, that uh, uh, I can see that the capacity development for the 2030 agenda is about uh, three actions in three levels. Building narratives, balancing approaches, influencing decisions in the personal, institutional, and political level. And I'm gonna share with you some of the uh, takeaways that I thought uh, during this period uh, over here in Brazil. And I could see some small, a number of similarities with, with the countries in Latin America and the Caribbean. Last year, we, we received the GESDR dissemination workshop in Brasilia with a number of experts from the Latin America and the Caribbean as well. And we could see some uh, uh, similarities on what are they are facing uh, during these years and right now as well. So we can pass this slide, please. Uh, 
yes, yeah, you, you can go uh, directly to the personal. In the personal level, we, we what I can see that we need to build narratives that fit with the person we want to influence. Sometimes we saw so many people that are trying to use their mindsets of course, sustainable development uh, and put in the mindset of the other that they are trying to convince in some of the decisions. And they normally, they're not part of the arena of the influence. And so that's that's the point of the language of the sustainable development needs to be fit in the, in the heads of those who are, uh, who are in a position for change, especially in the government. Understand our own limits. Uh, I saw in the journey so many people, transformative agents, that they got sick and frustrated so many times uh, during this process because uh, we've been uh, trying uh, to um, share our insights in, the, in our minds without any openness from the other side. So we try to learn, understand our limits and the limits of the person who wants to change. Sometimes there is a limit of a change in their mindsets and get out of the status quo. Uh, do not say what the person needs to do if you do not have openness. It's much better than from, from it's much better leading by by change for the by the example than by speeches. So sometimes the best way is to transform by act by your own actions and try to put the, the person that you want to influence uh, to view what you've been done. Uh, uh, as an action, because normally the locus of change is a safe space. Uh, and every time I saw people that are trying to change in a very risky spaces, they, they are not part of the arena for influencing as well. If you can go to the institutional level, uh, my main takeaways are like, bring, stone, bring strong institutions on board, bring investment in areas where the institution has never had before, Put the decision makers in a space where they have never participated before and internationalize the agenda. It's a, it is. Uh, build the narrative that the institution is not the only one. Why everything is uh, about this is connected because uh, even if there are institutions that it's not have the culture for sustainable development, uh, every time we try to bring, especially UN agencies or international organizations that are uh, uh, investing their time and their people on sustainable development, we could bring changes in the institutional uh, mindset, culture, and projects. That's why it's important. And even if there is a leader that's a very a strong position, someone that there's not the mindset for sustainable development yet, but if you put their person in some spaces and some projects that they never participate before, sometimes it change and can uh, and and can uh, transform. Some things, uh, some things in their institutions as well. And finally, uh, the political level, uh, if, if you can pass, yes. It's a very hard moment. And sometimes we can have only one chance to influence someone in a political level. Um, and so that's why my perception is that, that we need to be synthetic sometimes because the person or the, 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 the board or someone that is responsible for the policies in Brazil, uh, that they don't have time to read and listen to you most of the time. So uh, uh, you not, and, and not, and another point, you're not being recognized most of the time with your recommendations, and you're not going to receive any feedbacks on your recommendations on a political level. And you're not, no, you're not know if your recommendation is going to be used for somehow, so you're not going to know the next decisions. So that's why I'm gonna share one of the examples I had last year. Uh, if you can go to the last slide. Uh, this, I'm not gonna read this, you can read right now, but that was my only one chance after these seven, six to seven years working in this field as a practitioner. Uh, uh, last year, the government, the government transition team uh, called me and invited me to, read, uh, to write a text like two or three paragraphs maximum uh, that would go to the center government. Uh, and probably this text would be part of the transition report for the government. But I didn't, uh, like, it's not a promise. So we need to share in Portuguese. So sorry for, like, sometimes the translation is not the best one because I wrote this in Portuguese. But um, you need to share with us the status quo in Brazil. Uh, the status of the implementation of the 2030 agenda and some recommendations for the central government. And, you, and that was my chance. So 
I, not, I need to try to write something for them. And I, it was very hard because after four years with so many, so so much like so much damage, and the country, it's very hard to explain everything that happened in just a, just some two or three paragraphs, you know. So that's that's what I wrote. I tried to recommend three suggestions for the central government and national policy for the implementation of the 2030 agenda the creation of a new a, a new a national governance mechanism between various public, both sector, private, civil society and academia, and a, and a more practicable alignment of the SDGs with the, the, the plannings that we have in the country, like uh, public uh, policy planning and management cycle measurements and so on. But uh, after that, uh, probably I'm not gonna know uh, I didn't have any feedback. I saw that the person just received my text. Uh, I know that was created the National Commission for the SDGs that is this governance, new not governance mechanism, uh, but there's not a national policy yet. And, and, and I think that is very hard to align our uh, Brazilian national plans with the, the 2030 agenda right now. Uh, I'm just gonna finish Simona, sorry for that, yeah. And, but, uh, but that's my just one of the I can I can share a little bit more about the insights for this position and, and the questions. Thank you a lot. Thank you, Joao. Um, it's it's very interesting to see that you're emphasizing essentially in terms of the capabilities that it's not so much just about what you need to know, but it's actually very much about how you get the individual to be involved the personal level, but also the political level. How do you read the environment in which you are acting? And, and this actually, um, I'd like to go into a second round of, of our discussion very briefly, and we're going to have to, to keep it brief and maybe we can um, spotlight uh, all of the speakers in a moment or uh, as we go into the next panel. But just want to say, on this issue of capacities, we essentially, over the last few years, it has been mentioned more and more. And we've we've now seen it doesn't it doesn't seem that we don't know what needs to be done, but that we don't know really how to uh, how to address it. It's and there seems to be a knowing doing gap in in actually doing the right thing, but not just in terms of the substantive knowledge we have, but also in terms of how institutions are shaped and how the individuals in these institutions are actually able to take action. And already the, the Human Development Report in 2020 emphasized this notion of agency, talked about moving from learning uh, to self-enforcing social norms, sort of what needs to happen for the people who are involved in all of this to intrinsically feel that something needs to change. Um, there was also recently a study from the world's largest lesson looking at school curricula around the world, trying to understand to what extent they build those capacities among young people. And the title of the study was ready, willing and able, essentially to say, unless you are ready, willing and able, and that has to do with the subjects you're taught, but it's much more than that. Um, and also within uh, the UN system, for those of you joining us from uh, from UN agencies know that there's a lot of conversation about the UN 2.0, looking at the capabilities that UN personnel need to be able to do the right thing. So the, the question, of, of course, is not just about these individual capacities, but really how do we fill this knowing doing gap? So I'm just going to give you uh, another half minute, Joao, because you sort of ate your time for the second round, to just say, what do you think needs to happen to build those capacities very concretely? Uh, and then we'll move to Ambuch, as who I still consider uh, the part of the inventors of the capacity development labor, to let us know what needs to happen, that these capacities are, that there's an uptake for these capabilities. And then I'll let you close us off, Ime, uh, looking to towards the next report, but I'll, I'll say a little bit more about that in a second. Joao, over to you really quickly. What needs to happen? Thanks, thanks a lot. It's gonna be very quick. Uh, um, uh, for my opinion, it's like we need to rebuild the empowerment from people that they are, that the sense of they're in a safe space right now to explore uh, uh, their new projects and initiatives. So we lost uh, institutional memory during these four years. People are not, are not, were not part of the arena of the decisions anymore. People with very good 
uh, solutions and uh, initiatives. And also we need to rebuild the empowerment of these people that they are now in a safe space and you can share uh, that um, and in all the institutions you are part of right now, you can implement the 2030 agenda with free, uh, without uh, prohibitions. You know, that's that's the point that I saw in my country. Thank you, Joao. So, Andrzej, how do we make sure that these capacities are actually built? Uh, uh, that's a difficult question. First of all, I want to clarify, I'm not the inventor. Uh, a lot of people have been talking about capacity questions and even within the report i was i i will i was a strong proponent of that but i was not the only one so i i want to make sure that the credit is shared with all of my colleagues on that uh, you know you just actually i i was kind of quite taken when you talked about ready willing and able actually if i'm thinking about capacity i'm going to flip that around i think we need to think about able willing and then ready and i think that also links to uh, joao's kind of uh, understanding of, I think a lot of what he talked about was kind of strategically being ready to take care of opportunities, but also understanding who is it that you're engaging with. But I think this, if, if you start with ability as the first capacity or, or thinking about what ability means, I think that to me, I'm also an academic, so for me, that's kind of a personal kind of uh, way to think about things, that that's how you really get started on, on engagement. So when you're asking about how to build capacity, we have to understand what are the different kind of capacities that needed. I laid out some examples in the in the uh, in my remarks earlier, but really we don't have a very systematic understanding of the capacities that are needed and how to build them. So to me, even, even the notion of capacity, while we understand its importance, that itself is an area of inquiry where we need to understand this much better. And I'll emphasize in different national contexts. Uh, but it's not enough to have this knowledge. I think we know we must know how to work together with uh, different stakeholders. And I, I think I would say particularly citizens and policymakers. Those are two key constituencies that uh, folks like us who are in the knowledge space have to have to have to link up with because there's no point in having knowledge in the abstract and it's not really translating translating into positive change for the kind of transformations we were talking about earlier. And for that, you have to work with citizens and policymakers, both in order to build common cause uh, and agreement on what the priorities are, the nature of the transformations we want, but then also in driving those transformations, you need to work with closely with both of these groups. So to my mind, actually, it really is a multifaceted uh, uh, agenda in, in understanding the capacity needs better, building those capacities, therefore building that, doing that ability, working with colleagues uh, in various stakeholder groups. And that actually then allows us to be the willing and also be ready to drive the change. Thanks. Thank you, Ambuch. And I guess you are also referring a lot to the political space that Joao was already uh, mentioning in, in his um, in his presentation and we're starting to get some questions in the chat um, before replying to them directly and one of them in fact goes into that direction i would like to ask you Ime, now that you've been involved in in uh, co-chairing the report and looking to 2027 when the last uh, gsdr will be published before the the end of the 2030 framework and it will probably look back um, over the progress by then and already start making some suggestions for whatever would come next, I suppose. But what would you advise the next uh, independent group of scientists in terms of the focus that the, the report should have and the core issues that, that it should explore as we approach the, the second, well, as we move quickly into the second half of, of the agenda? Yeah, I think um, I think the the report should try to identify uh, stories which illustrate this uh, transformation cycle we were um, we have lined out, and it uh, of course ideally uh, success stories, and then go into the specificities of the success. So to identify um, context specific integrated use of levers and um, and also make clear what type of context require what 
but uh, but I think it probably it would also be interesting to have stories of stagnation or abortion of change actually to see what were what are the obstacles which happen and um, what made it so difficult to to overcome them. I know that uh, UN reports always like to have positive stories, yeah. Um, uh, but I mean, I refer to times of crisis, and these crises won't be come less in the coming years. And that is now my second point. I think it is it's very important to argue in favor of um, of a scenario what will happen after 2030, because um, so far the SDGs in the 2030 agenda are still a common basis for, for not all, but many or most of the governments. And I think it is extremely important to maintain a positive multilateral platform, which brings countries together. Uh, because in times of crisis, uh, multilateral cooperation and dialogue platforms need to be protected. And I think one idea I had was maybe to revive the intergovernmental working group. Uh, to have a, a stock take moment, uh, like we did in 20 uh, uh, until 2015, when we said there is unfinished business with the MDGs, let's put take them on board and let add what's needed, and that could be an approach also for for the next agenda after 20, uh, which would start then in 2031. What's the unfinished business? What is it that we have overlooked and which needs to be added, like digitalization, for example, or AI and um, uh, and what what would how to reformulate and update um, but but main, basically maintain the space yeah so not uh, create everything um, and new thanks thanks Ime and yes of course when you talk about Poly crisis, times of crisis, poly crisis, uh, the the evolution of the multilateral system. Um, we really, at this point, do not know how far we're going to come uh, over the next uh, six, seven years, and therefore the 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 conversation about that safe space that Joao talked about, about the ability to instill a sense of agency, um, so that things are not just coming from the top down, but are really driven bottom up, that there's a solid base. And I think Joao also said that um, at the end of the day, also in times of difficult political contexts, when there is a solid base of committed individuals in strong institutions ready to drive change that um, can still play an important role. We do have a few questions in the chat. We have a first question from Dauda, who's essentially saying, how do you deal with with transformation when you have different, a change in political priorities at country level that can affect the wider transformation? And also, um, what? how do you balance that when with programs that have just been put out there for political reasons? Uh, and we have another question or a question comment from uh, Silke, who's essentially saying that when we look at capacities, we can think of skills and knowledge as much as of shifts in mindsets. And of course, there's no panacea, as you said, uh, it's very context specific, but also against the background of urgency. Do you have any suggestion concerning where to put the emphasis? And particularly when we think of the UN as an actor providing support to transformations in countries and societies. So between uh, the, the skills and the knowledge as much as the shift in mindsets. Um, Dowd has also uh, added saying that uh, agencies have been working less and less recently on capacity building programs, um, even though it seems that this is becoming such an important focus. I guess that's that's more of a comment. And, and I would, of course, as a, a representative of a learning and training institution, second that because the first budgets that often get cut are the learning and training budgets. Now, when we talk about capacity development, that obviously goes much beyond uh, specific learning and training offerings. But it is true um, that while there is a strong focus on capacity building in, in all the uh, communications, um, it is sometimes lacking when it comes to the actual facts. However, I would say with the uh, UN 2.0 um, capabilities uh, initiative, this, this um, emphasis has indeed been 
much strengthened again over recent times. Anyone would like to react to the comments, um, questions we've we've received at this point? And please, everyone, feel free to also share your experiences, your reflections. And, and as Ime said, um, also any examples of where things uh, didn't work, which, which were always um, less inclined to do. Who would like to react first? Ambuj, thanks, go ahead. Sure, I can, I can take a crack at, uh, those are difficult questions, first of all, especially the first one about the change in political priorities. Uh, I mean, I think that's, uh, First of all, I, again, there's no simple answer to this, but I, I do think that uh, when I was talking earlier about uh, the need to think about uh, citizen groups, and that's in fact one of the uh, levers is also collective action. Uh, I think it's really important that one is able to build a broad-based consensus, uh, not just among the policymakers, but also among citizens about the nature of transformations that that society is uh, willing to engage in. Uh, I believe that there's actually broader societal consensus than uh, policymakers also and politicians have to respond to that. I think it's, it becomes much more difficult then to completely change kind of political political direction. And that I think also in a sense becomes an answer to Silke's question about where is it that you would focus first? I actually think that while uh, you, you know, the transformations really are a kind of a complex, a long drawn out process. Uh, building early consensus on the kind of transformations that are relevant for any particular societal context, I think is really important. Uh, I'll just give you an example, right? I mean, if one is thinking about reducing emissions from, uh, from transport, and I'm sorry if my examples, a lot of them come from the energy and climate space, uh, that's where I work. Uh, but if one is thinking about reducing emissions from the transport space, uh, in Norway, the example, uh, the, the answer has been very much, let's move very strongly towards electric vehicles, makes a lot of sense for that country. But it need not make equal sense for, uh, let's say, a smaller country like Kenya or, or Ghana. The electric vehicles may play a much smaller role, and therefore, the nature of the societal transformation in that context for thinking about how to provide transportation services with uh, least uh, climate impact may be a very different answer. And that has to be an answer that has to be discussed locally, generated locally, and stabilized locally. And that's when you then start thinking about what is the nature of the transformation process you want, given the kind of objectives you want uh, in relationship to your own national aspirations and context. Uh, I think if that's where we need to really start. And if one starts that, that also kind of at least shields a little bit towards the kind of shifts that might happen when different kind of political parties might come into power. I'll stop with that. Thank you. Thank you. Joao, can you share with us a little bit how that has played out in the context of Enapi? I think you've essentially faced a situation very similar to what Dauda um, alludes to. Yeah, I, I, I would like to react to um, the comment about the uh, UN support, acting support, uh, in, in my experience, that UN support me a lot, support my institution a lot, to legitimize our work with people who at first didn't believe it. Because we take risks when we propose to change, especially in a risk political zone. But when every time uh, when like UN agencies and internet, other international organizations come with us on board, uh, uh, the construction moves away from the idea of something personal that want to change something and towards something that involves a global governance structure. So that's why I still believe in the support of the United Nations and countries like mine. So that's that's was important during these four years to legitimize our work over here. Thank you, Joao. That's that's important uh, to hear. Ime, any reflections? Yeah, I think the questions are not easy to answer. Actually, how um, if I take the two, uh, Silke is asking where to how to set priorities in a context where the need is everywhere. Actually, if you if you remember the first slide, and there I think that. Um, I mean, the, uh, 
I also now focus on on the UN as an as an actor, uh, like the country teams and so on. Uh, UN have a have a, a long stay, a long presence. So they also have a long uh, and consolidated knowledge actually of the structures which characterize the, the place they are, and what also the the specific um, capabilities for change already are. So. Um, I don't think there will be a one country which is really prepared and willing to, ad to address all 17 SDGs with the same level of energy and resources. Yeah, um, This is, is not the case in Germany, for example, where you would say theoretically they could be able to do that, no. Um, so it requires, a, it, what the UN can do is, for example, and, and we know that it depends on, on the political constellation, how where the energy for, for reform focuses on, if there is energy for reform at all. So probably it makes sense to have a two-pronged approach in saying, let's invest in building the capacities for change. So context-specific knowledge and, um, and co cooperate with those parts of public administration or institutions like ENAP which are willing to, to um, embrace the idea of transformative change and start building the capacities and making practical experiences. Uh, so, so I think, uh, and, and the other approach then is at each new political cycle, depending on, on the country, identify those act actors which, which are closest to, to change and to transformation. Um, and then, use kind of the, uh, the, the, um, the recommendation Jean made by saying, expose those who are willing to change to international arenas where they can exchange with others, yeah, for example, so that they feel, okay, I'm not alone with this and, and I can learn from the others. And maybe a third uh, point, I don't know, a third level is also important, um, cities as places of change and cities as places where um, often it is easier to, to have a critical mass of, of um, uh, public administration, policy makers, um, uh, um, civil society in a, in a broad sense, uh, who can come together and, and, and start changing uh, things. Yeah. So let's not look for the perfect constellation, but let's work with what we have. But then... Um, so that's why I think this IPPN is very important uh, resource uh, and instrument for that also. Maybe it's possible to use the IPPN for identifying these positive case studies I was mentioning and you could send them over to the next IGS. <laughs> Yes, and actually I hear from the agencies um, who are managing the IPPN and uh, that the focus on the GSDR uh, it has also become more, more strong in terms of looking at the entry points for transformation and the levers and how that can be showcased. And maybe there is something there uh, to explore going both ways to then also inform uh, even the next report. But I'll leave that to uh, Serge and Nadine from, from the network to, to discuss further. But indeed, what I'm hearing you say is uh, relates a lot to the to the individuals who are involved and 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 to um, the ability to create spaces of reflection, create safe spaces of reflection, create opportunities for exposure to examples from other parts of the world, to feel empowered, to feel that sense of agency. Um, Dauda has just drawn the attention more specifically to the institutional instability. And maybe we can just do, and she's giving the example of a state reform program she ran in Mali uh, between 2016, 2018, um, where the anchor ministry changed four times and, and it was really difficult to actually work with an institution because the institution itself uh, was unstable. So I wonder if you have any last reflections and I think we can do um, one last round just on essentially what can be done, not just to stabilize institutions, but also to help institutions think across 
sectors and across actors, because of course you showed that image of the globe uh, with this um, with this graph from the um, uh, from the ICSO uh, report on. Um, linkages between different SDGs that shows that we really need to get much better at looking at the linkages, but then different institutions are often created in to look more into silos. So any any last suggestions you have in terms of building the capacity of institutions to look to work in more intersectoral ways, uh, how to stabilize them? I'm not I'm not sure. Um, oh, and we also actually have one question from Ernesto now on um, whether you have any thoughts on the six key transitions that were identified in the SDG summit in 2023. I don't know if you're, I mean, you're certainly aware of them. They are quite similar to the six entry points, but they're not exactly the same. So I don't know if you've had um, any reflections about that as well. So with that, I would open a last really quick round. Um, Silke is also asking another quick follow up. What kind of reactions did you get on adding capacity building as a lever? As we heard, it wasn't so high on the agenda, maybe also because quick wins over short time frames are hard to achieve. So any last reflections you want to share in, in this very last round on the various issues we have now touched upon? I would say let's go um, back in the inverted order, Joao, then Ambuch, and then we close with him. Is that all right? So I start? Yes. OK, that's good. That's good. just a, a quick uh, remarks. Uh, so I, I think that sometimes slowing down to speed up in sustainability agendas uh, uh, is important in some uh, crises and scenarios in a political scenario, like uh, in with the comment over here in, in Mali, right? Yes. So sometimes that's important in order to balance the transformative programming with the elected programming, it's it, there is a zone there where both programmes can survive together and be connected. Uh, if the transformative program don't uh, cross the limits of the elected program, uh, uh, they can be survived together and connected somehow. Probably they're not going to be the same, but we need to understand there is this zone where each transformative program and elected program can be together. In the same in the same political structure. That's it. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Joao. Um, uh, let me respond to two of the, or try and respond to two of the questions that you had posed. Uh, I'll start with this with the last one or uh, the comment, which is about uh, not uh, not having that much attention on capacity uh, and what was the response to us adding it as lever. Uh, I'm, of course, biased, but I think the response has been fairly positive. Uh, and uh, I think we've given uh, some different uh, presentations, have had multiple interactions with colleagues uh, in different parts of the world of the GSDR. Uh, and I think uh, while it's not, uh, capacity sounds like a simple concept, but once you start discussing it, people actually do, first of all, uh, are uh, kind of a little bit taken uh, it takes some time for them to observe the, uh, absorb the notions of different forms of capacity. But I think when you really start thinking it through, uh, the value of that, uh, of capacity and capacity building really comes through. And I think people begin to understand how it's important. It's important in, in many different ways. You know, the, the uh, SDG transformation framework talks about these different levers. You even need to have some capacity to understand how to use science and technology. How do you use economy and finance in the right way? So in a sense, capacity really is foundational and underlies everything. And I think once you begin to understand that and understand its importance, uh, uh, I think there is kind of an uptake of that. And at least for the UN agencies and others, I would actually say I, I do understand that there is skepticism also because many of the past capacity building programs have not been very successful. And I would make the case that they have not been successful because I think they took a very narrow conception of capacity they didn't, there wasn't really a full understanding of what are the kind of capacities that are needed and how do you build them. And so, for example, simple training courses were presented as full capacity building. It's a small piece of the overall story. Uh, so I think it's up to us to actually think about how do you uh, understand the capacity issue and take it forward. I want to kind of just say, you know, Gandhi's quote is be the change you want to see. So if you want to see capacity building as an important part of the future, then we ourselves have to make sure that we carry that flag forward. 
Uh, very quickly to your point about how do you work across different sectors and how do you actors work together? Uh, I think it's a very uh, complicated question. Uh, in the sciences, we also struggle with the same questions of how do you work people across disciplines? Uh, and, uh, you know, there are, again, there's no simple answer to that. Uh, basically, I think the way people, you get people to work together is by highlight, and this has certainly worked in the sciences, by highlighting to them the opportunities of the benefits from working together. Uh, the kind of problems we are talking about, it's impossible for any single actor to make a big impact, to make a big difference. And therefore, we have to be able to highlight the added opportunity of working together with other actors and working together in synergies, uh, leveraging complementary uh, capabilities, avoiding duplication, and therefore really enable, uh, in, in, in a sense, being able to achieve much more than you could do by yourself. I think that's absolutely, absolutely key. Of course, as somebody who actually studies public policy or policy, one also has to provide incentives then to individuals and agencies to be able to work together. Um, maybe whether you provide them resources to work with other colleagues, whether you create actually spaces for uh, people to work together in the area of science and technology studies, people talk about boundary organizations that can actually work at interfaces. There are many different ways in which one can actually promote uh, this working across sectors and working across actors. Uh, I think it's not just a theoretical question, I think it's practically a really important question because if we are really to get where we want to go, where we started the conversation to really be able to accelerate the agenda towards the SDGs, I think we have no choice but to work across sectors and work across actors. Thanks. Thanks a lot, Um. So, Ime, over to you. Yeah. Um, I would like to add, um, no, I would like to react to these uh, key transitions or entry points, what we think about that. Uh, I see that they are similar uh, with ours, but they put different emphasis. They include digital connectivity, which we didn't uh, mention. But the point when you, and, and they formulate this, the sixth one, climate change, biodiversity, loss, and pollution, that's the UN idea of tribal crisis. Huh? So, so it's just adjusting, uh, you, you can rearrange many of the SDGs in very different entry points, depending on, on what, um, what, your, what your perspective on what needs to come together for actually achieving transformation is. And that brings me back to the point of context uh, uh, adaptation. And whether you use the entry points or the six key transitions, you will always have to translate them to the local reality where they should be enacted. Yeah. So um, it's, that's why I would take them as a suggestion. Yeah. It's really a suggestion. And, if, and, and the UN uh, cannot just force them through. I mean, they, they will go through change when being uh, um, domesticated or adjusted to, to local reality. And I think that is, this flexibility needs to be there. The, uh, and at, but at the same time, it should be clear that um, the transitions should be designed in a way that they really speak to and identify synergies. Yeah. So uh, that's very important. So that, uh, because otherwise they would miss an important um, characteristic for acceleration or implementation effort. And the second thing, um, and, and what I haven't, we haven't mentioned it, and I didn't, uh, and, and also don't see it in the key transitions is that the important role of, of gender, yeah? Of gender, of SDG five, uh, um, in, uh, empowering women, yeah? Uh, I think that is uh, a, a thing we, in our um, last chapter in the, in the recommendations, we highlighted that. Uh, because in, in many analyses, we see that implementing SDG 5 has a lot of positive synergies with most of SDGs. Um, so that could also be framed as a key transition. Yeah. Um, and th this brings me to my last point, which is accountability. You know, we didn't mention it in, in it today, but it's we mentioned it in our report that uh, accountability plays an important role in, in making progress. And uh, so I think um, 
uh, strengthen identifying uh, accountability systems at local level, at um, subnational level, national level, uh, which which are part of the of the um, institutional structure of the country where you are in, and strengthen them. Yeah, I think that is very important, and see how you you can uh, integrate uh, civil society um, in a broad sense um, in this in these um, accountability mechanisms. Thank you so much. I think we have now come to the end of our discussion. We're, we're exactly on the hour. I think in many ways, what you've all told us is that we need to leave our comfort zones in, in, in many different ways, whether it is about the kind of other disciplines, other institutions, other actors we engage with, the way we bring people together, the way we ensure that spaces can be safe to share not just the successes, but also the failures and ultimately how we are able to address complexity and also disclose what we don't know uh, and struggle together so that we look at our perspectives in terms of where the synergies could lie, what we what our assumptions are, unpacking them very clearly um, and essentially reaching a consensus in terms of where we want to go together. Now, with this, I think we've come to the end for today. Again, the, the, the challenge is huge, but some of those core ideas around entry points for transformation and the necessity to focus on capacity development have certainly landed. This is to be continued. I I'd like to thank uh, the three of you, Joao, uh, Ambuj, Ime, very much for your uh, inputs. Also, thank you very much, uh, Serge, Nadine, IPPN uh, at large for the trust in having us moderate today. I'd like, to, I'd like to invite you to join the IPPN network to continue the conversation. You will access the presentations, the recording of today's sessions, uh, all kinds of other relevant resources through the link that is posted in the chat. And also next, the next meeting next month actually continues on this idea of capacity development, looking at another flagship initiative that emerged from the 2023 SDG Summit on Education Systems Transformation. So stay tuned um, and join that if you can. Thank you so much and hoping uh, to see all of you next time. And thank you again, Nadine and Serge for the trust in having us moderate this time. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.